So glad to be here. Nice turnout. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. I don't know. I don't see her. Oh, hey, great information. I sure learned a lot. That's going to help out with bees for sure, honeybees specifically. So a bit about me is I'm a third generation apiarist. I'm a hobby beekeeper, currently have two hives and member of the San Mateo Bee Guild. I don't know how, you, how, much, how familiar you guys are with bee guilds, but usually every city has one, or county at least, and it's, it's a great organization. If you want to start a hive, you need any information, help, tools, whatever it may be, they'll help you guys out. So let me tell you how I got started into it. My grandfather was an apiarist in the, ba in the old country. When my dad came here, he started doing it as a hobby as well. And uh, one day, I, I mean, I would help them out. And then one day I heard my aunt or someone saying, oh, did you try your dad's honey? And I had no idea he was doing it. I'm highly competitive. <laughs> so, so I went, I purchased the hive, I started doing that. And now everyone craves mine over his. So <laughs> that's how it is. And then a few, that same year, he did the same thing with tomatoes and lettuce, and now I have a patch of all sorts of stuff. And incidentally, I've actually used Master Gardeners. I was telling Peggy, you guys are a great resource, especially the email program you guys have. I'm not sure. There you go. Yeah, so I actually use that for a lot of my relatives think I'm, I'm a genius. I'm really not. <laughs> I just take pictures, send it to you guys, explain what's going on, and then I get an email back. I go back to them, and this is the specific problem. It gets fixed, and boom, I look like the smart guy. So thank you, guys. <laughs> All right, let's get started here. We're going to talk about bees in the Bay Area, hierarchy within the hive, roles, and the responsibilities of bees, because there is a really set uh, role and responsibility pattern that they have. We'll uh, dwell into foraging and pollination, threats to colonies, different technologies that are emerging, and then Q&A. So bees in the Bay Area. Specific to California, there's, as uh, Jennifer mentioned, there's 1,600 native species. Some are social, but most are solitary. So a lot of what you will see, let's say something flying around, you wouldn't suspect it to be a bee, but it is. It's part of the species, but there's so many different colors and sizes and variations that it's not the typical bee that we might uh, envision. So there's 90 specific uh, bees to the Bay Area, and the Western honeybee is not, is not a native bee from here, but it was introduced in the 17th century from Europe. It's native to Europe, Africa, and the Middle East. So the honeybee is divided into three uh, categories. We have the workers, the drones, and the queen. Each one has a very specific role within the hive. When I learned about this, it's, it's pretty astonishing to see how each one uh, performs their duties and how they stick to it. They don't deviate at all. So worker bees, they are 95% of the population. So the majority of what you see are gonna be worker bees. They're all females and have role, different roles within the hive. This depends on uh, their age. And by age, we're not talking months or years, we're talking days. So usually they will be either, uh, they'll start off as house bees, and then they'll uh, turn into forager bees. Now, the next slide is gonna show you for the, for the different days and what they do in each time of those days. This is split up specifically to present to you guys, but there will be some overlap, but just take that into consideration. So day one to three is cleaning the hive. Day three to 12, rearing the young and serving the queen. Day 12 to 20 is building. 20 to 23, guarding the hive. And day 23 to 43 is gathering nectar and pollen. So from day one to three, as soon as they're born, is they'll start cleaning the hive, making it sterile, for additional cells to be born. So the first thing that they do once they get out of their caps, their cells, they'll polish their own cells, clean it, make it ready for the queen to lay a new patch in there, lay some eggs. If it's not clean, the, the queen will skip over it and until it is, basically. <laughs> 
So they ensure that the hive is disease-free and sterile, and one of the most important duties they have is they perform undertaker duties. So if there's any, let's say, dead ants, other bees, uh, in some cases, if a, uh, a mouse or something tries to attempt to uh, infiltrate the hive, they'll cover it, they'll sting it first, and then they'll cover it in the bee glue, which is propolis. And then they'll take it as far away as possible from the hive, but in a case where it's a mouse, it's too big, the propolis has natural antibacterial qualities, so no need to have it uh, taken far away. So day three to 12, we have rearing and serving. So they, the worker bees are essentially, have the most tedious task in the hive. So they have to care for developing larva. They feed honey, pollen, and royal jelly to the bees, to the larva, and then check on them up to a thousand times a day. Some say 1,300, a thousand, but that's basically their role. All they do is check up on the bees, see that they're being developed properly, etc. And then they serve the queen and care for the drones. So everything is done by the worker bees. It's a tedious task, and that they are there to serve the hive, basically. <laughs> So here we have the working, uh, they're feeding larva in the brood cells. I don't know if how clear it is, but. So on day 12 through 20, they build new combs and cap cells of developing bees. They produce, they have glands that produce wax flakes. So that's how the honeycomb is made, which is located in glands under, on, on the underside of their bellies. And in order to eat, they need 18 pounds of honey just to produce two pounds of beeswax. So if you consider it such a small insect, that's quite a bit, quite a bit of honey. And then here's the, here are the glands producing the uh, wax. And then day 20 to 23, they act as bouncers. So if you go to my hive right now, there's all, I know them. I personally know my bouncers. They're, they're always there. Sometimes they're a little bit away, but they're nearby. If I get close, they'll all swarm and come to the front to protect the hive. And then they, they can st uh, sting multiple times, and they sting mammals, ants, whatever it may be. They're there to protect the hive. So if you do go, usually honeybees, they're not aggressive. If you don't bother them or uh, don't pose a threat, they're not going to really do anything. But in the chance that you are, they will sting. So gathering, day 23 to 43. Foragers find flowers and fill their pollen baskets. Here you can see, where was this thing? Is it not show? Oh, it's on, the, it's on the next slide. So all bees except for the queen depend on pollen and nectar. The queen depends on royal jelly, which is fed by the uh, workers. The pollen is the protein source for bees, and nectar is the energy source. So these are the two main things, which is why it's so important to have flowers around. Without this, they would not be able to survive. And they use, they actually have a very unique way of showing where these sources are to one another using a, the, a dance. So they alert, depending on this dance, uh, a bee, and other bees can see, okay, it's, there's a source, really good source here, this many miles away, and it's pretty accurate. So it's pretty astonishing, pretty interesting to follow. We'll see a video of that later. And then the average life, lifespan of the worker bee is six weeks old. So imagine what a short period. They start working day one and dead by six weeks. So it's a pretty tedious lifestyle. So here are the sacks, as Jennifer was mentioning as well. The bee with the honey sacks. I mean, uh, pollen sacks, I'm sorry. And here are comb cells filled with the pollen. We'll get more into that later on. So the dance. The dance is used to communicate and relay messages, like I mentioned. It's uh, there to alert people, uh, alert other bees when to swarm, direction and distance of food sources, water sources, new nest sites, etc. So there will be cases when honeybees, they need a new hive. They might get weak. Another hive might infiltrate. 
it's a very uh, interesting pattern that they have. So this way, the, when they use these dances, you know, they can find where to nest, make a new nest, or where the uh, sources of food are. And the figure eight waggle dance, that's what they've named it, and is used back at the hive to tell others where to find the flowers, and dance shows the direction of flowers relative to the sun. So it's pretty calculated, pretty accurate, more than I could do, basically. <laughs> and the speed of the dance indicates how far the nectar is from the hive. Next, we'll move on to the drones. The drones are all males, and their sole purpose in life is to mate with the queen. This is it. That's all they do. They don't, they don't feed themselves. They don't do anything. They're, all they do is, is are supposed to mate with the queen. And they have a lifespan of eight weeks. And again, they're taken care of by the worker bees. But the one downside to their being is <laughs> that if they overcrowd, if the, if the hive needs space, or it's getting too hot, the worker bees will kick them out. No problem. <laughs> no problems at all of getting kicked out. So how do we recognize a drone? They're stouter and longer than workers, and their eyes are two times bigger than the worker's eyes. This is evolutionary because they need to see where they're going and where, the, where they can mate with the queen. And then the queen is the only fertile female in the hive. This is not... 100% true, their worker bees have been known to lay eggs, but about 1% of the time, I think, and uh, they only produce drones. So in the industry, they say that, you know, the queen is the only fertile uh, female in the hive. They spend most of their life in the brood chamber, which is in uh, the honeycomb, and they have a lifespan of two to three years. And they are, although they are the queen, it's not like they're the ultimate ruler. It's more of, they're, they're the mother figure of the hive. So what that means is, if they're not performing their duties, they've become infertile, the worker bees again, will, they won't put up with her. They will kick her out and feed royal jelly to new cells, and then they'll decide on a queen. On a new queen, I'm sorry. And how do we recognize the queen? They are larger and longer, and they are often marked in hives by beekeepers. And they, I don't have that uh, personally, but some of them do, and here's, that's how it is. So they'll mark it like that. So for the colony to survive, it's essential that the queen is present. If a queen is not present, colony will swarm away. No problem, they always need to be there. And uh, they are basically the mother of the hive, like I said. They can lay 2,000 eggs a day, which equates to one egg every 43 seconds. They leave the hive for a few days to mate. See, I didn't know this at first either. So they leave the hive to mate. You would think it's a continuous thing where they would go and mate, come back, lay eggs, and repeat. They only mate once in their lifetime and they, they will mate with 30 drones, and that's enough to last them to fertilize all their eggs for a lifetime. So once they go, come back, come back into the hive, they're basically not leaving. That's, that's their set. And they never visit flowers or make honey. So a virgin queen will leave the hive for a couple days. They'll take a few short flights out, strengthen their wings, come back, do a test flight, then they'll make their way out to uh, the swarming area, that's where the drones are, high up in the air, and they'll mate with the drones up there, in the, really high up, also known as a drone congregation. So each time the queen mates, she receives six million spermatozoa. The, once the sperm sack is full, like I said, the, the, the entire uh, task will take care of the lifetime laying of eggs for her. Any questions so far? No? How high up is the drone swarm? How, like, what? 10 feet, No, 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 we're talking hundreds of feet. Yeah, oh, wow. hundreds of feet. Sometimes even multiple hundreds of feet. Yeah. You won't be able to see it with the naked eye, basically. Yes? So when I hive swarms, is that for the purpose solely of mating? Sometimes you see a hive swarming. Uh, no, a hive will swarm if it's weak, if it's been, uh, if a new queen has been decided, let's say the current queen is not doing its job, some will go with the old queen. They're really loyal. Some of them, 
they'll stay with the old. So it's not only just for mating. What's the radius of feeding for a bee, and is it unique to each species? Good question. So well, I'm going to get to that too, but just to answer it right off the bat, it's usually two to three miles for feeding. So they'll go two to three miles. Sometimes up to five miles have been observed. So when the queen is no longer fertile, worker bees will kill her and make a new queen. And this is done so by feeding uh, the cells royal jelly. Without the royal jelly, there will be no queen made. So they have to be fed royal jelly. And the weird thing about this, or the interesting thing is, a few uh, cells are chosen to be the uh, future queen. Once the first one is produced, it'll, bo it'll uh, come out of the cell and it'll stab the other remaining cells to ensure that it has the position of the queen. So that's why it's Game of Thrones. It's very, <laughs> it's very interesting that as soon as it, you know, it uh, comes to life, it knows what to do. The first thing, it's going to go secure its spot. So here's to answer your question, sir. They travel two to three miles from the hive, bring back bounty to the worker bees, and the worker bees essentially uh, store these uh, pollens and nectars in the cell for the hive to thrive on, and they visit four million flowers to make two pounds of honey, again. And a single bee makes one-tenth, approximately, a teaspoon in a lifetime of honey. So in my hive, I believe one of them has, there is... 49,000 bees and counting when I first started, and another one has 60,000, just to give you a perspective. So how many, how many stacks are in your hive? Mine are uh, four stack. Yeah, but you can get two stacks, uh, three. You, usually it's two to three. But I'm trying to compete against my dad, so. Yeah. <laughs> and also, how does the the first queen to emerge, know where to look for all the other potential queens? Is it, does she just know that, oh, these they are... just, Yeah, that's, that's the interesting part. I don't know if, if it's been studied or not. I sure haven't found it, but it knows instinctively to, you know, you're going to come to life and you're going to just stab the other cells. Instinct of nature, maybe. I'm not, I'm not really sure. I, I could look into it, but yes. What's your Royal jelly is, it has specific pheromones and it's uh, from specific pollens and stuff like that, that it's only usually regularly fed to the queen. It is fed to uh, some of the worker bees initially, but then they uh, change the diet to just pollen and nectar. So a queen is always fed royal jelly. Pollination, which is Jennifer's forte. So the most important thing bees do is pollination, as we all know, and I'm sure you guys might know this, but while visiting flowers, pollen from the stamen, the male productive organ of the flower, stick to their hairs, and then when they visit the next flower, some of this pollen is rubbed off onto the stigma, the tip of the pistil, which is the female reproductive organ of the flower. We have from Britannica, which shows the cross-pollination of how the bee takes pollen from one flower and goes to the next. Like Jennifer mentioned, there are other more effective bees, which I did not know. She taught me, which, which was great. And she asked if it would uh, bother me. It doesn't. It was good to learn that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you can diss them. It's okay. Uh, but the honeybees are... They're pretty effective, plus they create honey, which is a benefit. So. so how do the bees choose flowers? They choose flowers that are full of nectar, brightly colored. They prefer yellow and blue. And they can see, uh, I thought I had added a picture, apparently I did not, where they have ultraviolet vision. So they can see a regular petal to us of a flower, they see it just in black and white, where the white portion is just full of nectar, and that's what they go for. So they have a sweetly aromatic and minty fragrance, open in the daytime, and this is more of to provide a landing spot to them. So they need a safe, safe landing spot, so that's they go for symmetrical flowers which offer this. 
and flowers uh, that are often tubular with nectar at the base of the tube. So colors of the flowers, like I said, yellow and blue. And bees cannot see red, so this is why they typically like yellow and blue flowers. Scent of the flowers are uh, smell around and spatially using their antenna. So they communicate and uh, sense the flowers from that. And they are drawn to single flowers with one ring of petals. They provide more nectar and pollen than double flowers. And the blue, purple, and yellow flowers tend to have the most nectar, which is the energy source for bees. Many flowers pollinated by bees have regions of low ultraviolet reflectance near center of each petal. They are invisible to us, but they can see it. So that's why they are attracted more to those types of flowers. Now, a lot of people think that if bees, goes extinct, if bees go extinct, we're going to go extinct as well. That's not really true, but a lot of the crops we depend on, some of the list is here, uh, would not be available if it weren't for bees. That's going to mean exorbitant prices, shortages, etc. And another uh, study that's out there is a lot of people think that if you eat local uh, honey, it might help your allergies. For some people it does, some people it doesn't. We're not really sure. We just spoke to a uh, Stanford pediatrician allergist, actually, a specialist who said that same thing. Some, for some people it helps, some people it doesn't, but there's no conclusive evidence that it does. So it doesn't hurt to try it. There's no negative uh, effects. So. Bee po popula uh, population has been on the decline for the past decade. And they did a study where between April 2020 and April 2021, we lost about 45.5% of the managed honeybee colonies. This is a drastic effect, uh, especially on the agriculture industry. And so the, the interesting part about it is some of it, scientists don't know why they're declining. So that's what they're trying to study. Major threats are colony collapse disorder, CCD, and that's a phenomenon char uh, characterized by the sudden loss of the vast majority of the hive. So a beekeeper will go check out his hive one day, it's healthy, he'll go the next day and it's, it's done. They're either dead or they've left. Most recent evidence of decline, according to the USDA, is the combination of parasites and pests, pathogens, poor nutrition, and sublethal exposure to pesticides. We'll get into this a little bit more. So the current research indicates that parasites and disease they carry are the main threat to honeybees. The most common one is the Varroa destructor. That's the Latin name, which we know as Varroa mites. And it's not the mites in themselves that are harmful to the bees. It's the disease that they carry. So this is the most dangerous threat to bees right now. So the effect that Varroa mites have on bees is the same effect that ticks have on us, mammals. So the main issue lies with the disease the mites carry, which causes deformed wing virus. It's, this affects the bees before they are even born, so they can't even emerge as adults. This is a drastic issue that's been currently being studied, and uh, hopefully they'll make some headway. Diseases. Weakened immune systems leave hives successful to bacterial and viral diseases. American fowl brood, this disease affects the larvae less than a day old and doesn't allow for the emergence of adults. And like the varroa mites, the deformed wing virus, which prevents bees from being able to fly. Poor nutrition. One of the main reasons is monoculture farming where let's say you just have uh, orchards, hundreds of acres of just almonds, hundreds of acres of just oranges. With, with the lack of variety, they're not getting the proper nutrition that's needed to thrive. As a result, mal malnutrition or malnourished bees are more susceptible to chemical pesticides, parasites, pathogens, and their immune systems don't develop as strong as they should. Some of the pesticides are neonicotinoids. This is the most studied chemical culprit in the industry, and it's systemic. Plants take them into their vascular system, and it spreads to all the plant's tissues, 
and are effective only after one application. So all they need to do, be applied once and it uh, causes harm already. In theory, this shouldn't affect bees because they're not ingesting the plant itself. But studies have found trace amounts of pollen in grains. And these, when the bees bring back the pollen to their hives and it's ingested, chemicals tend to accumulate over time and it har uh, harms the hive. Pesticides also uh, interfere with bee communication, which they use to communicate within the hive, where good sources are, etc. And that's one of the main factors that are uh, causing destruction is, is tearing down their communication lines. So here we're talking about technologies. There are some preventative technologies. So I, I haven't used any, I've researched them. So as a beekeeper for two hives, it's not really, I can check on my two hives, but those who have hundreds of hives, new smart technologies available where it tells you the temperature of the hive, uh, is the water content enough? Are they producing enough? So these are the pre preventative technologies that are available for beekeepers. That'll help ensure that the, thrive, uh, the uh, hives are thriving as they should, and if need be, a beekeeper can take initiative and you know, prevent something worse happening. And they place a, a sensor on the roof of the beehive, which relays all their information to your smartphone, computer, email, etc. Robotic bees. This is currently the last I heard a few weeks ago. They're testing it in um, greenhouses and it's been effective. So they're essentially mini drones, just like the drones we see for photography, etc. They go from uh, plant to plant, pollinate. I don't know how effective this is going to be on a larger scale, but uh, a startup is trying it and as a last resort, I assume, you know, that it can be used, but I can't imagine it being used on the larger scale for hundreds and hundreds of thousands of acres. <laughs> yeah, they do. You can hack it to make it sting, yeah. So ways you can help, you guys are the best source. You guys educate, you guys practice, so that's not more to it. You guys are the ones making this happen. And as Jennifer has provi uh, stated, provide a, a bee-friendly habitat. So choose plants that attract bees, plant them close to one another, pick plants with long blooming cycles, let your plants flower, and most importantly, or equally importantly, provide a fresh water source. So here we have a, what a, Jennifer, you can maybe comment on this. Does, is this a... Oh, great, I saw your slides before you presented. Right, so it's pretty good, right? So here we have a garden. I mean, it, it would be great to have a garden. It might not be possible for everyone, but it's pretty good where it shows you have bugs, a wild area, compost heap, water, essentially everything you need for the beehive to thrive and uh, survive. This is what a typical garden would look like. In California, we're fortunate enough to be able to grow a lot of the things. Not so much in the Midwest, uh, depending on the weather. But this is one of the best ways, along with educating people on how to uh, further the bee population. That's in the bee lawn? Bee, it's just the lawn, that's just the lawn. It's just the very lawn with dandelions and stuff. It's not specific to it's, it's saying it's a lawn for bees. So it's for bees. Right, right. Yeah. All right. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Thank you so much. That was great. Oh, but one thing. If I don't know, I don't, I'm not an expert. And, and there's too much to learn for really anyone to be an expert. So I'm learning as I go. So if there's a question I can't answer, I'll tell you and I'll get back to you. If that's okay. <laughs> I might ask you guys, maybe someone will answer. Um, okay, we do have a couple questions. Sure. Annually, a swarm nests in our yard for a day or days. Are they from a bee box or a natural hive? It can be both. 
It can be both. I've, uh, we've, I know my dad has had bees leave the box, and uh, I know there's plenty of uh, natural ones. So if, if it ever bothers you guys, just call your local bee guild, email them. That's what I do, usually email them. There'll be maybe like 10 volunteers that same day willing to come and get your hive because they'll reuse them uh, for their own boxes. Yes. I wanted to mention, I'm a beekeeper myself. Yeah, I noticed. Thanks for bringing that. Well, I wanted to mention that this is begotten, uh, be, the beginning of swarm season right. now, and the easiest way to become a beekeeper is to put out the hive box, empty hive box, and some pharaoh, and have a swarm move in. Because all my colonies, I have like uh, seven colonies. Right, nice. All from swarms in my neighborhood. Yeah, that's what I did. Yeah, exactly. That's what I did. Swarms is the best way to go. Yeah, instead of letting a swarm die out, you know, we can, we can uh, provide a hive for them and keep them strong. Okay, and do you have another question? Yes, ma'am. Are carpenter bees that board and take live native here? Car I believe I'm... Right? Yeah, I believe so. Jennifer just uh, confirmed that. I'm not a pro on carpenter bees, but yes, carpenter bees and I think leaf cutters yeah. are also native, right? Yeah. We have more. All right. Are drones found only from the same hive? <coughs> is there inbreeding? They're actually, that's a great question. Usually they try to not uh, have inbreeding, so they'll the swarm that you see high up in there, it's from different hives. Yeah, so the mate will go there. I also had that question in the beginning, like how is, you know, I didn't know the mating process as much, but it's, they do their best to uh, prevent inbreeding. Um, so you belong to a bee guild. Right. There's all these monocultures of almond trees and cherry trees, and there's nothing for the bees to feed on other than the monoculture. Right. So why does the, why do the beekeepers and the bee guilds not require the people who are putting in these monocultures to plant like a mile long strip or a quarter mile long strip in between fields with tons of different flowers for them to have a better diet and right. stronger? Because you're getting paid to bring in bee boxes. Right. That's a great question. It's a great question. I'm sure some of it has to do with farmers saying, you know, what, you can't tell us what to do. Why, why would we lose a row of almonds that are going to profit us so much? I would assume that's part of it. Another part is these are seasonal. So when uh, a, a beekeeper is running a business pollinating, let's say, almonds, they'll take them for the season, they'll take them out, and then they might have a good source of food. So it's not like the, uh, the boxes are there permanently. Does that make sense? It's not really for the bees. But, right, yeah, it doesn't. But I, I understand your point of view. It might, I don't think bee guilds are strong enough to you know, go up to, a, especially their lobbying and stuff like that, to prevent these, maybe in the future, to make these changes, which is a great idea. But until the government comes in or local you know, ordinances are put in place, that's going to be impossible. But great idea. I agree. But some places are putting in hedgerows, like some of the want. Are they? Right. Yeah. So intentionally planting for bees, but it is taking square footage away from. Right. Right. Yes. So I have a, a bee house for about three years. Not one bee has entered it. And there's mud around, and it's a south facing. I wouldn't think so. You have you have a nice uh, variety of different types of flowers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 Should it be like right in the middle of uh, a group of flowers? No, it doesn't have to be. Not not usually. No. I mean, try to experiment with it. Try to if you can, if it's easily uh, you know mobile. Try to experiment, see what you get. Right. No. Where Where do you do, Where do you purchase the pheromones? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you part of a bee guild? That's different than a bee box. You talk right. 
Right, right, right. For native plants. Right. For native bees. Um, yes, sir. So to answer her question, the whole size is wrong. Yeah. If you look at where the bees go uh, after uh, bark beetles emerge from pine trees, that's the whole size they're looking for. And if you go to a, a website called Crown Bees, they have the uh, diameters specific to the different types of bees in our area. For us, to piggyback on his idea or uh, information, we have reducers. Do you use reducers on some of your boxes for the entrance? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And depending on the time of year, my bees right now are not as active during the winter, especially when it's cold. But if I open the box, it's, they're just swarming in there. Keeping the, a hive has to maintain a certain temperature. It cannot deviate by 0.1 degree. Yeah, so they have to maintain that, and they do that using the, the flapping of their wings. Yes, sir. And just to clarify, with the almond crop, the reason that they don't uh, intercrop with pollinators is it interferes with the harvesting equipment. Uh -huh. They use shakers. Right. And all the stuff goes on the ground. And if there's uh, plants uh, that are not almonds, it makes it much more difficult to uh, pick up the almonds. Would this also, would there be an issue about cross interference or anything, maybe with, with the almonds, if you, uh, if you. No, uh, not if you plant it right. So if you put in uh, uh, what are called gills. Uh, so a guild is seven to 12 plants. Each of the plants are doing something specific to the gill. Okay. So a lot of uh, the arm, almond farmers, they're not concerned about gills. They're concerned about A, profit, B, profit, C, profit. <laughs> and so they're not going to be bothered with, with intercropping. The other right. part of this is they bring in millions and millions of bees across country. So if I'm a bee and I'm riding a semi from North Carolina, <laughs> by the time I get here, I'm pretty sick. Yeah. yeah. And the good news is that almonds are very high protein nectar crop for bees and so they're able to heal themselves but it's only six weeks and it's gone and then there's nothing so that's why it's such a, a, a big food desert for them right mm -hmm. guys we have one more question how is nectar transported nectar is transported via, via the tongue so i don't know if i mentioned that in here uh, yeah but They'll, they'll bring it back to the hive, and then the worker bees will store it for later they consumption. They transport it. They've got pollen sacs, but nectar is kind of liquid, so how do they transport it? Sacs in their uh, mouths. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? <clears throat> I just had one. Sorry. How, sure. You, you mentioned counting the bees that you have in your hive. Do, do you have an average of each um, panel? No, it all varies, but I know when I, when I purchase the bees, I know how many, I got local, I purchased a local swarm and that's how they estimated it. I'm not sure. Someone must have been very bored. Do you have any idea how they estimate it? I would assume by weight. Right, probably, yeah. Yeah. Yes. A worker bee, uh, I'm not sure, drones. It's, uh, for smaller insects, they can sting multiple times, but a big one, if they lose the stinger, they're going to die immediately. I just want to thank you on behalf of thank all you. of us. That was a wonderful Thanks. presentation. Thanks. Thanks.